So the Dimension Shellshock DLC came out far sooner than I ever expected it to. August 31st, I was willing to bet it would be sometime in the fall considering how small the Shredder's Revenge team really is, but they revealed both the second character and the release date in the final trailer less than two weeks away from it dropping. That was definitely a surprise, and I was really hoping to get my video done in time, but unfortunately it had to be delayed due to home improvement. I wasn't going to pack my entire computer setup with me to the place I was staying at, so sorry about the wait. First off, let's look at the patch itself. I might miss a few things because the developers never released patch notes for the update that I can find anywhere, and the patch notes channel in their Discord has not been updated since November of last year. So here's what I could gather when it comes to gameplay changes. The dodging has been buffed. There's significantly less hang time after dodging, so it can be done way faster now. The Heavy Swing now allows you to cancel out of it with a dodge roll. This means you can charge a Heavy Swing, dodge out of the way of an attack, do a follow-up attack, and keep the button held down for the instant Heavy Swing trick. Your overall defense is much better with these changes. I could live without the dodge speed buff, but it's nice to have, and the Heavy Swing cancel was a highly requested feature. The Foot Soldier Bash, on the other hand, got nerfed. It happens way faster now, so there's a smaller window to hit the other enemies, and it means shorter invulnerability. The only boss change I've noticed is a nerf to Super Shredder. He's ever so slightly slower now, but he's still awful to fight due to his overall design. As for the enemies, I bitched about the floor crawlers and how annoying they are, but this patch seemingly nerfed them to where they get insta-flipped by a slide now. Much better. They're no longer immune to dive supers as well, so hell yeah. Supers in general were tweaked across the board. I won't go into deep details as Green Link did a pretty good video about it, but to put it simply, Mikey and Leo had their ground supers buffed with more hitboxes and more damage as a whole. It's actually kind of on par with Donatello and Casey Jones, but without the vacuum thing. Dive supers, on the other hand, have been nerfed for the entire cast with a smaller area of effect. Taunting has also been overhauled, so now with the exception of Karai, every single character has the exact same taunt speed. Makes sense for this change, as Raphael could get free supers very easily, but now it's more balanced and Casey isn't completely terrible in this regard. With this change in dive supers, I've actually found myself using dodge supers a lot more to deal with horizontal stretches of enemies. Some characters have really good dodge supers for this, but I feel like some more balancing is in order if they want dodge supers to be a consistently good option across the board. Seriously, April's is fucking awful. The alternate colors were free with this patch, so you don't actually need to buy Dimension Shellshock for the extra colors. This is a great feature, because for the longest time, every turtle was the same shade of green, which could get confusing in co-op. There have been mods on PC for a long time to mitigate this, but console players had zero access to these, and they overwrote the default colors in the files. The colors are full of references to other TMNT incarnations, mainly 2003, 2012, and Rise. There's other ones, like a sewage green to match the games released on the original Game Boy, or the other ones based on various toys. This is really neat fan service, so if you want a live-action Splinter, you can have that. Unfortunately, though, this patch has a downside. It kind of broke modding a bit. Right now, various character mods cannot be used due to the patch changing the way the files work. This will probably be resolved soon, but I just thought it was something worth pointing out. You can't have Shrek over Splinter, this is literally 1994. Now on to the paid content. The two characters you get access to are Usagi Miyamoto and Karai. Usagi is actually a character from another comic series that crossed over with TMNT various times over the years, and while Karai is a TMNT character, she never appeared in the 87 series. Both of these characters are pretty wacky. They both have 7 stars for their stats just like Casey Jones, basically making a third of the entire roster better than everyone else at first glance. They've got a lot of unique characteristics which make the pack worth buying instead of just the same moveset again with different stats. Usagi's main gimmick is the fact that he has no somersault slice or dive kick, instead being able to do full air combos. This is a weird ability to have, but if you can time it right, you can do some crazy shit in the air. Where this falls apart, however, is with select bosses. Wingnut can be destroyed by spamming launchers and dive kicks, but with Usagi, you need to rethink your approach, because 9 times out of 10 you're going to get hit by the missiles when you finish an air combo. With enemies, on the other hand, this adds a whole new element to Usagi's gameplay. Certain enemies are airborne, so you need to do a lot of launchers or somersault slices to take care of them with the rest of the cast. But with Usagi, the air combo makes them seamlessly fit in with the other enemies. These white foot soldiers with swords counter all of your attacks, and they can only be damaged after they jump and stab their sword into the ground. Usagi can interrupt their dive with his air combo, so you don't even have to wait for them to attack. The Psy guys can be completely worked around their attack patterns by just attacking them in the air, it's nuts. His ground super is similar to Leonardo's, but it's a bit bigger, and it launches enemies into the air in case they don't die. His dive super has a few mid-air hits before slamming into the ground, and his dodge super is fucking instantaneous. Look at this, it's so cool. Overall, Usagi is pretty sweet. My only gripe is that the voice lines that play when picking up the items are the same as the turtles, so you hear, Go Green Machine when you're not fucking green. Just carrying over the ones from the other characters, including Karai, would have fixed this. Speaking of Karai, let's talk about her now. Her moveset is mostly similar to the rest of the cast, as she has the somersault slice and dive kick Usagi lacks, 
but she's on some fuck shit. Okay, remember in my original review when I did a whole segment talking about how broken Raphael is? Well, Karai is giving Rath a run for his money. This bitch is fucking ruthless. First off, Karai is already meant to be a very flashy character. Her launcher hits multiple times like April, her jab launches enemies into the air, her side throw travels farther than the rest of the cast, her dodge attack and slide hit multiple times just like her launcher, and instead of bashing a foot soldier side to side, she fucking carries them into the stratosphere and smashes them into the concrete. She's fast, she's powerful, and she's got a unique mechanic. It's basically an invisible meter that builds up with consecutive damage, kind of like the super bar, but it only charges up to 2 instead of 3 and you lose it after getting hit too much. What does this do? Well, it makes Karai even faster than she already is, I'm not kidding. The screen can't even keep up with her at max speed, she Naruto runs to the edge of the screen even when it's scrolling. This is a really cool mechanic as it rewards players that have mastered the combat with a speed boost. Her taunt goes from the slowest in the game to the fastest, and the supers, my god the supers. These supers make her look like a boss character, her ground super especially. You need to master good positioning, but when you get it right, wow, it especially shreds bosses that move horizontally. Her dive super is the weirdest one in the whole game, and it's more so useful on groups of enemies rather than bosses. And like Usagi, her dodge super is awesome. Karai's biggest downside is her lack of consistency. Building up her speed and keeping it takes a lot of focus, and taking just a few hits completely undoes that. Another major flaw is her dodge roll attack. Unlike the rest of the cast, Karai's hits multiple times and goes through enemies. How is this a downside? Well, everyone else's dodge roll attack stopping after hitting an enemy guarantees a safe distance. Where Karai's falls apart is with bosses that require a lot of dodging. Take the Turtle Tenderizer for example. Dodge roll attacks are a vital part of winning here, and if Karai does one, she instantly gets hit by the truck and knocked to the left of the screen, so you'll need a different approach. Karai is so lovingly crafted to fit into this game's style despite the fact she never appeared in the 87 series. She still has the goofier animations like getting bit by mousers and squashed, but at the same time, she radiates this badass energy that the rest of the cast lacks. She talks like she's above everyone else, like referring to Krang as an insolent slug, saying Shredder brought shame to the Foot Clan, or beating a boss and saying you were no match for me. I mean, she could literally fly, so I think she's got a point. And her taunt, she literally does the you should kill yourself now meme. Overall, Karai is a bit of a glass cannon with her downsides. If you can work around them, you've got yourself a serious contender for best character, but if you're not skilled enough, you're gonna die. But that's only half of the DLC pack. Time to dive into the main selling point of Dimension Shellshock, Survival Mode. To put it simply, it's a horde mode where you try to survive as long as possible with the end of each wave giving you two portals to go into, which take you to another area of whatever dimension you're currently in. These portals contain either perks, power-ups, health, boss transformations, or crystals to fill out the meter at the bottom, and when that's filled up, you get transported to the next dimension. Don't worry about your friend, you'll be seeing him soon in the next dimension! No, Nappa, I meant literal dimension. Honestly, it's pretty fun, but it's got some major issues. For one, the portal pickups are completely random, meaning there's a good chance both portals will have the same thing. Like, why would I pick the portal that has less crystals? The perks you can get are pretty cool, but some are kind of detrimental unless you're really good at the game, and the main issue here is that you don't see the perk description until after you pick it up. This can lead to a run ending at the very next wave if you don't know what all the perks are. The boss transformations are very hit or miss. Of course it's a big power up that can save your ass if you're struggling, but the only worthwhile one you desperately want to keep is Shredder. Bebop and Rocksteady don't have any unique air attacks and just do their ground punch while airborne, and Shredder is way faster than them with a super counter that absolutely, no pun intended, shreds groups of enemies. As for the bosses you fight, with the exception of an ending boss, they're recycled from the base game. Nothing wrong with that, but they included the co-op bosses here, and when separated from their main fight, they fall apart, especially Toka and Razar. They never fall down and they rarely change their attacks, so you can just mindlessly dodge and hit over and over until they die. As for that final boss... It's Super Shredder again. <laughs> okay, it's a different fight, and he's recolored to look like his 4Kids design, but it's still Super Shredder. This is actually kind of better than his base game fight, as you can damage him at any time. After beating him, you have the option to either keep your run going, or to quit immediately for an ending that has Raphael bite into Counter-Strike Source Pizza without downloading the game first. As much as I enjoy this mode, it's got some serious problems regarding a lack of attention to detail. I already mentioned the problem with the crystals and the portals earlier, but for the health pizza, it always shows the party pizza from co-op in story mode, even if you're playing by yourself. The enemy waves feel completely random regardless of challenge level. Sometimes a wave can end in 10 seconds, other times it's a minute and a half. And every single wave ends with the same victory jingle for beating a boss in story mode, so you hear it constantly. The last problem relates to co-op. 
The portals work on a voting system, so the portal with the most players is what gets chosen. If a boss transformation gets picked, it's not whoever walks in first, instead it's random. So there's a chance one player can walk into the other portal, obviously lose the vote, and they're the one that gets picked to be the boss for some reason. In the end, Dimension Shellshock is a solid add-on to Shredder's Revenge. You get two characters with unique mechanics and playstyles that stick out from the main roster, and a pretty neat little distraction in the form of survival. For 8 bucks, it's a good amount of content. My main problem with it, as well as this entire patch itself because of some glitches I ran into, is that it feels insanely rushed. What the hell? Omni -channel. It's a blank no, it's a no, it's a blank screen on my end. What? No, dude, what? I'm not even what? doing anything. Like it's like bl the screen's like blank on my end for some reason. <laughs> what? A Nickelodeon product getting rushed out the door to an unreasonable deadline, resulting in the product taking a hit in quality? Are you insane? That's never happened. The flaws I mentioned earlier with survival as well as the abundance of glitches and apparent crashes across consoles feel like really basic things that Tribute and Dotemu would obviously catch. I think they're still here because they just did not have time to fix them. I've got a feeling that Nickelodeon told them halfway through August to hurry the fuck up on the DLC because Mutant Mayhem didn't exactly set the world on fire at the box office. Okay, just barely as of the time of writing. Since this was announced in June with a set release date of later this year, Tribute took their time when developing the content. Since Nickelodeon seemingly told them they wanted money now, 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 they just didn't have time to fix the glaring issues. I guess they just barely made it in terms of getting a playable version ready for the 31st, as near the end of August, Dotemu got special coverage done with IGN and uploaded exclusive gameplay of Usagi and Karai, but not in the survival mode, instead they were playing story with them. My final clue as to why I think Nickelodeon shoved this out the door is the release date. August 31st, man, that was just one day before the release of Mutant Mayhem on digital services. Nickelodeon has a history of having tie-in products for upcoming releases, even if it's a different incarnation of the IP. Sponge on the Run was originally going to be released in mid-2020, but got delayed due to Corona. Wanna know it didn't get delayed? A tie-in product which was released at the same deadline resulting in questionable quality. It's also a game, and it goes by the name of Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated. Nick has done this before. Obviously it's not the end of the world, as Dadimu can still release more patches without a deadline. I'm also not saying that Dimension Shellshock is anywhere near as bad as Rehydrated. This is still a very good pack but Nick refused to budge with the release date resulting in bumps in the road. If this had a little more time in the oven, survival would be much more refined. I guarantee you we're going to get a patch at some point that addresses a huge chunk of the issues with survival. But yeah, those are my thoughts on the DLC. If you like what you see, I recommend buying it. It's only 8 bucks and it's a good chunk of content for the price. That's really all I have to say, so I'll get out of your hair. He's not only from medieval Japan, but also from an alternate universe, so naturally, he speaks English.